little bit louder. Okay. I'll stand right here. Don't move. If anyone sees me trying to move, my, my wife maybe will, will wave. I tend to pace a little bit, but I'm not going to do that. Can you be in charge of that? Yes. Sometimes I get going talking, and I will just become oblivious to everything except talking about books. And um, But I'm going to, I see the timer there, and I'm going to stick to it. And for that reason, one thing about questions, I'm going to save time for questions at the end. Uh, just let me get through the talk. I'm not going to do questions in the middle, because sometimes that derails us a little bit. But here's the thing. Right after this, I'm going to be right outside, and I will stay until every question is answered or until noon when I have a thing. But then if we don't get to your question, find me anytime and interrupt, come find me at this thing, or send me a private message through Facebook. And I will answer every single question. If you don't hear back from me, it means I didn't get it and not that I'm ignoring you. Uh, sometimes they go into weird message requests things. I'll try to figure out how to check everything. So if we don't get your question asked, I promise we will get to all of them. I just want to avoid the super specific questions during the talk so I can try to hit as much useful stuff to the most people as possible. Okay, and I see that it is time. Um, thanks for coming. I'm Adam. I write under mostly A.C. Fuller and recently under my new pen name, D.D. Black. This is one of my favorite reviews of all time. Uh, I'm going to get to why in a little bit. Before I get really into it, though, I want to say thanks to all the volunteers and to Craig and Michael and the hundreds of people who make this thing happen. I was in the Facebook group uh, for 20 books in late 2016, I believe, when we had maybe 800 people in the group, and the first uh, conference at Samstown, where I still have fond memories of sitting with about 12 other people in the buffet at Samstown, and that was all the mystery thriller crime writers we could gather. That included cozy mystery people, sci-fi thriller people, and we had 12 or 13 eating cold ham in Sam's Town. And to see how this has grown is incredible. The mystery thriller thing tonight will probably have 400 people at it or something. So thanks to all the volunteers who make this happen. It's been integral to my career, and I hope it will be to yours. Okay, so here's what I'm going to talk about today. Different types of serial fiction. I'm going to focus on my expertise, which is novella serials. I'm going to talk about concepts. Uh, how to think about them, the craft of writing them, and the marketing of them. I'm going to touch on Vela and Radish and serial platforms in general. I'm not an expert at those, but I did interview multiple people who are doing six figures consistently on those platforms. So if you want to write serials on Vela or Radish, I'm not the leading expert on that, but I tried to become smart enough to offer some useful information about those while we're here. But there are people here who are leading experts on that, and I will try to help you find them if you want to follow up with them. But so my focus is on novella serials. And here's some, some of the authors I interviewed for this talk because I didn't want to just focus on my own books. I wanted to hit some other genres and people who were doing it before me and after me. Sarah K. Wilson, YA Fantasy. This is a novella serial that she did that was quite successful, and she has multiple of these now. Um, I'm just going to go through these pretty quickly. You can all follow up on these later. I, I don't know how you can access the slideshow, but there's got to be some way. If not, I'll just send you a PDF of it afterwards. So if you don't, if you can't find it somehow, if they don't put it online, then I'll send it to you. I tried to hit people writing in multiple different genres. I know there's a lot of people here writing romance or paranormal romance. Geneva Lee is killing it uh, with shorter serials. Another novella serial in fantasy. And these are some fairly niche um, projects that are on Radish. And this is my project, which I'll be basing a lot of what I say today on, which is called The Crime Beat. So first, briefly, for those who don't know, and I, most of you probably already know this, a serial is really just considered any larger work, usually fiction, that is broken up into smaller parts. So theoretically, you could just take a novel, publish it in you know 30 installments, 16 installments, and that would be a serial. You, in the olden days, you might have had three segments in a magazine over three months. Um, for me, I want to do something longer than a regular novel, but shorter than a huge series, and this is what I came up with, and I'll explain why a little bit. There's a long history of serials. Most of you probably know this. Some of our greatest novels were initially published as serials and then packaged as whole novels later. 
Uh, we don't have a lot of the magazines anymore that these were published in. They're long gone. But I think that KDP, Vela, Radish, and just our own self-publishing possibilities have made serials kind of start to come back a little bit in the way we can do them. Here's some more well-known serials. I could go on and on about this, but I don't want this to be a history lesson. But you can see a lot of great novels were initially published as serials. One of the nice things about them is you can publish them as serials, make money, and then repackage them as either full novels or as box sets of serials, which I'll also be talking about. So, novella serial concepts. That's what I'm going to start with. I want to talk a little bit about my inspiration. I had just finished a series in 2017, 2018. It was my second series, which I was sure was going to be my big breakout series, which bombed horrendously in terms of finances. My core readers loved it. It's still my wife's favorite series. But financially, it was disastrous. Nobody bought it. Nobody read it. BookBub wouldn't touch it. And I was in the position of, OK, go back to my day job, start teaching again, and figure out something that I want to write, but also I'm pretty sure will make money. And so I was watching these shows uh, at the time and trying to figure out what I wanted to write. I already wrote in the thriller and crime world. Uh, I was also doing the thing a lot of us probably do, which is browsing pre-made book covers instead of writing our own books. Um, I, I know a lot of people here love to procrastinate by doing that. Uh, love to spend money 10 covers out, 20 covers out, just because we see something we like. So I was browsing this site called Rocking Book Covers, uh, where I've gotten multiple covers done over, the, over time. I loved this cover. Um, I thought it looked like kind of an old school crime cover. And I had already been thinking about shows like this that are nine, 10, eight episodes that give you one story that covers the entire season and also gives you 45 minute, one hour episodes that give you some satisfaction along the way. So I, I was thinking about these, saw this cover, contacted the designer and said, can you make me a series based on this? I want to buy this cover and then I want you to make me this. And that's what he came up with. You can see the first cover is exactly the same. And then he came up with the others. I don't know how he did it, but and I thought they were gorgeous. My wife did. I also thought they were a little bit different than what was coming out uh, in the thriller world. These don't look like a lot of the covers in thriller. But my strategy in this case was to make something that looked a little more on the traditional end. Um, and I thought probably BookBub would like them, which they turned out to. And that was a big part of my strategy, which I'll get to later. OK, so this was my concept. And I don't really know why I came up with it. It was just I was going to do nine episodes. I was watching a lot of you know, prestige TV, these new shows with high production values where they give us nine episodes, 10 episodes for a season. And a lot of us are watching those, right? We all have our favorite dramas or whatever shows we watch on HBO or AMC or Showtime or whatever. That is the way a lot of people are consuming stories right now, right? We all know that. We're binge watching stuff on Netflix when they drop 10 episodes at a time. Or every Sunday we're watching House of the Dragon or whatever our favorite show is whenever it comes out. So I wanted to do something like that. Um, I want it to be longer than a novel, and I wanted the concept, the structure of it, these nine episodes, to actually be tied to the story in a way that didn't feel random. So I didn't want to take a novel and hack it into nine parts. I wanted to make the story and the concept tied together in a way that a reader would see and say, okay, this makes some sense that this is nine parts instead of one really long book. And you'll see when I talk about reviews, it didn't make sense to all the readers. Um, it pissed a lot of people off, um, but that's, that's what's going to happen. By the way, for those who are thinking about doing Vela, um, if you go read the reviews of the top Vela projects, there are a lot of negative reviews like the one I had up on the screen that say, love this five-star book, one-star structure and concept. Why isn't this one book? Um, but a lot of people just buy them all anyway. Um, and a lot of people like the structure, too. So you just have to be prepared for some negative feedback. So this was the concept I was working on. And anyone see the movie Seven? Probably people of a certain generation. It was a fairly important movie. Here's a little scene. There are seven deadly sins. Gluttony. You're going to come take a look at this. Greed. No one touches anything. Sloth, wrath, pride, lust, and envy. Seven. You can expect five more of these. So I wasn't going to get Morgan Freeman for my book, unfortunately, or the movie adaptation, although it, it could happen still. Um, but 
I remembered this scene from this movie because when I saw this in the movie, they immediately had me, right? The concept was, oh, we've had a murder, we don't know anything about it. Then there's a second murder, and Morgan Freeman is smart enough to know, we're gonna, this is a seven deadly sin serial killer. So we know as a reader, as a viewer in this case, there are going to be five more murders. Can they stop them before the five murders take place? You have a ticking clock that is tied into the story, to the, what the villain is trying to do, in a way that at least to 20 year old me when I saw this movie, totally worked. If this had been a serial, imagine this as seven novellas broken up, one for each of the deadly sins, I would have been all in after this and fought all of them. So I stole this scene and put it at the end of book one of my serial, um, in my own way obviously, but the same kind of concept. Telling the reader that there are going to be X number more murders and you're going to need to read the whole thing, in this case finish the movie in order to find out what happened. And I don't think this only applies to crime and mystery. I have some, oh yeah, so this is what I did. That's, this is what I just said. So this is the last page of episode one, the New York episode of my series. Uh, I'll just explain what it means. They've got this cryptic message saying uh, from the first killer. So in the first book, they solve the first crime. They know who killed the guy, right? Uh, the guy ends up committing suicide, so it can't be questioned by the police. So why did he do it? We don't really know. But they take a picture of his laptop with an open email with cryptic messages, and it says two slash nine, what the hell does that mean? Then someone else gets murdered, and the detectives say, there's going to be probably seven more of these. So the second murder takes place right at the end of book one, after wrapping up the first murder, and then we realize, oh, this is a serial killer thing, there's some big plot, I don't understand it, but we know there's going to be nine of these in total. Oh, and hey, look, this is a nine book series with pretty covers and it's nine different cities and early on in the book there's they find out a clue that there was nine of these custom rifles purchased on the dark web so it's all coming together so readers at this point know exactly what they're getting and they can bail if they want to bail or they can go all in and as I'll get to later a lot of people bailed but if you have enough readers of the first book you can still make quite a bit of money off of it so I can, these are literally the first things I thought of um, of how you could come up with a concept that might work for a novella serial in different genres. Please come up with better concepts than this. I don't know where I got number two from. Um, to totally original. Right, but I think you could apply this to erotica, to romance, to uh, fantasy, obviously, we've seen some successful examples. I think you can really apply it to any genre. How the readers in that genre will respond to it, I'm a little less sure of. I think, you know, say th for the romance people in here, for example, um, I, I would be less confident saying they're going to respond the same way. They might. Obviously, romance readers are responding very well in some cases on Vela and Radish, uh, and they are devouring stuff. Would a novella serial do the same? I'm not sure. I don't have personally any phenomenal examples of those. They're probably out there and I missed them. Um, but anyway, this is the idea is that the story is tied to the structure in a way that will not make it feel like this is a novel hacked into nine parts or six parts or 12 parts. Is that making sense to people? And, and that's really just to make the reader feel like there's some sense to this as a, as a serial. Also, it's because personally, I like stories like that. Um, my favorite kind of shows, I had True Detective up on here, my favorite kind of shows are ones where I know I'm gonna get a whole season, I know there's multiple plot lines that are gonna take nine, 10, 12 episodes to resolve, but I also know that within any given episode of an hour, I'm gonna get a nice chunk resolved. That's the way I like to consume stuff. I like novels also, but um, I think it's the way a lot of people are used to consuming stories now. So here's one of the people I interviewed. Um, and the point of this is really that he based his structure on the tarot. And each novella is based on um, a single tarot card. And there's 21 of them total. I think he said 20 plus one is the novella prequel maybe that he gave away for free. Um, but the idea is that it's not just a 700 page epic fantasy cut into 21 chunks. It has some concept that's tied to it. So that's the concept. So, and by the way, when we do questions, 
I will happily brainstorm your specific concept. This is the most fun thing to me. So if you want to talk about some idea you have, either privately, outside, or grab the mic when this is over, um, I love to do that. So here, in terms of the craft, now we're going to talk a little bit about the writing. Once you have your concept, obviously covers, critically important. Um, by the way, with my covers, you know, I said I was aiming for a slightly more traditional look with the covers. I was very much prepared to throw those covers out if they didn't work. If Book, book Club didn't take uh, book one within my first few submissions, I would have gotten rid of those covers, found the hottest thriller covers around, which are almost always guys or gals running down the street like this, you know, a dark alley, whatever, right? That's most of the covers we see, holding a gun, not holding a gun. That's what we see over and over and over again. I would have gone there if these covers failed. These covers didn't fail, but for me, that is a marketing decision. It wouldn't have hurt my feelings. If it didn't work, I would have fixed it because I wanted this series to sell. Luckily, those, those covers did really well. Craft. Unity of story and structure I talked about. Multiple arcs I'm going to talk about again. We're all familiar with this. Pick your favorite one-hour drama, and you will find especially stuff that's on cable and not network TV. Network TV does do this, but I think the shows on, on you know, AMC, HBO, Netflix do this. Um, people are a little more likely to accept an open-ended storyline on these other streaming platforms than on, on uh, network television. Episode one, twice as long as all the others. Why did anyone know why I did that? What? Bookbub, yes. Episode, uh, Bookbub's minimum is 150 pages. A 20,000 word novella is not gonna be 150, 150 pages unless you do some really crazy stuff with fonts or put in a bunch of crappy back matter, which do not do. Uh, it's not honest and readers don't like it. So episode one, you know how some shows do a double first episode, right? It's a, it's a 45 minute drama, but where the first one's an hour and a half. We're gonna tell you a bigger story. We're gonna introduce more characters. I wanted it to feel like that, and I wanted it to be long enough to hit 150 pages. Both because that would get readers more invested in the story and in the characters, because I could do more, but also because it would hit book clubs minimum, because that was gonna be a big part of my marketing plan. And then the craft is actually pretty simple. You'll see when I start quoting some other people here, cliffhangers, cliffhangers, cliffhangers. It's the only word that every single person I interviewed brought up. Um, people feel differently about cliffhangers. It's going to annoy some people. There are some techniques you can use to make better and worse cliffhangers, ones that piss people off a little bit less. Um, obviously, we saw the, the last page of episode one of my, of my serial. It had just resolved who the murderer was for book one. That was thoroughly wrapped up and felt neat, right? And now we're in the denouement where the characters are hanging out. Hey, we solved the crime. This is great. Then the next person is murdered. Then we find out, holy crap, this is probably part of a nine, a nine murder serial killing thing. So cliffhangers are great, but you also want to offer some nice resolution before the cliffhanger, um, I think. I mean, I, I'd love someone to test that. Just go all cliffhangers all the time. I think if you're in Vela or Radish or something, you maybe can go with cliffhanger after cliffhanger because you're dealing with chapters and not novellas in most cases. Maybe you're doing two chapters a week, one chapter a week, um, and maybe you can just go cliffhanger after cliffhanger. Short, simple chapters. When I talked to Sarah K. Wilson about her Dragon School series, she mentioned that her first one was the shortest, simplest, most basic storyline, and that one did by far better than the ones when she offered up a more complex plot, which is kind of sad in some ways, but she was very open. And by the way, everyone who spoke to me said I could share all their stuff. It's not, they all knew they were being interviewed for this talk. Um, that what I found fascinating. She was very open about the fact that her, her second, third, fourth ones didn't do quite as well, um, and she thinks it's because they were more complicated. So take, take from that what you will. Uh, short, simple chapters cliffhangers all the time, cliffhangers between chapters, cliffhangers between episodes or novellas or however you call them. So when I mentioned um, multiple arcs, by the way, this is one of my favorite memes. Um, I'm partially colorblind 
and I have zero graphic design skills. This is literally the best I can do. Um, I almost was too embarrassed to put this up here because I thought someone who's good at this could make a gorgeous slide out of this with colors and all the arrows. Anyway, this is, this is kind of how I thought about the storyline. So when I have my nine books, I bought all my covers before I started writing this thing. Um, I knew exactly what I was going into and I knew how I wanted it to feel to the reader. So the big rainbow over the top, right? Except I couldn't figure out how to make it a rainbow, so I just left it, whatever color this is, grayish. These are the series arcs. This is the stuff that is going to be woven through every single book. Uh, who is the mastermind of the killing, right? You play a video game, you fight a sub-boss, and then you don't get to the final boss till way later, right? The killer they catch in episode one is not the mastermind of this thing we find out. That's gonna have to wait till episode eight, nine. So you're giving the reader satisfaction. They've got the trigger man in episode one, but there's something much bigger going on here, and that's gotta last us nine episodes. Um, the main character in this is a journalist her husband died in Afghanistan while serving in Afghanistan under kind of murky circumstances. She's still troubled by that. You know the whole haunted past of the protagonist? That's right in here. Um, what happened to him? Did he just die or did someone kill him in Afghanistan? For her to feel personally satisfied, she's gonna need to figure that out. That's coming in episodes eight and nine and she's getting chunks of that splattered throughout episodes two, three, four, five, six, seven. And as it turns out, it's tied into the overall arc of the entire book in strange ways. Will the main character find peace? She's fairly troubled. Um, will she feel better? That's something she's not gonna feel better in episode one, but by episode nine, can she feel better? The second main character um, is estranged from his wife. Will they find love again? Will he reconcile with his daughter? Or will main character one and two end up romantically involved? That's another thing that goes the whole way. It's these two kind of opposites attract a cop and a journalist, and are they going to become romantically involved? It's just not a major plot line, but it's something you wonder about while reading. Uh, and then it's episode six, they finally kind of get a little too drunk. They don't end up going all the way, but um, they realize it's a bad idea. And in episode one, there's a very lovely dog that the, protect, that the villain isn't especially nice to and who's gonna take care of the dog. Uh, we can't leave that unresolved, right? It ends up fairly unresolved in episode one, but we have to resolve that by episode nine. If the dog doesn't end up safe and happy, your readers will cancel you, delete your books, dox you, I don't know. It'll go badly for you. And there's also a plant that our main character is too screwed up to take care of, it's half dead. Will she learn to take care of her plant or not? So we have a sad plant, a sad dog that needs help. We have all these storylines, and we've gotta go through the whole thing to find out. In addition to that, we've got these ones in the middle, right? These are in each episode. We're going to solve one murder per episode, roughly. However, we're not gonna solve the overall arc of the thing till later. Um, so these are the things you're getting in each episode. Breadcrumbs about all these things. We're gonna get some success. They do find big clues. They get closer to the truth, but then something goes awry and there's some failure thrown in there too. What I didn't mention also is that we probably all thought a lot about three act structure. One reason I chose nine is I wanted each of the three episodes to feel a little bit like a complete book. So one to three, four through six, seven through nine, they, those also follow a bit of a three act structure where the end of book three, so the end of the sort of first act is a huge cliffhanger that completely twists everything upside down. Uh, in a different way. And I figured that by then, if readers are bought in in book three, they're gonna stick with it mostly. And so you can get harder and harder cliffhangers as you go. That was what I was thinking. I'm not sure it worked out perfectly. I think if I did this again, I could probably get better read through on it by doing a few things differently. Um, okay, I've got 21 minutes. Again, graphic design is my passion. There's so many good versions of this meme, but this is my favorite one. So again, this is from uh, John Cron, uh, oh, I spelled his name wrong here, it should be Cronshaw, I thought I'd fix that. Sorry about that, John. Television writing. Um, some of us have probably read uh, the first uh, Game of Thrones book um, in the Song of Ice and Fire series, which George R. R. Martin wrote after he'd worked in television for about 10 years. 
And even though that is a massive book, I think it's like maybe 280,000, 320,000 words or something, the way he uses cliffhangers in that is very similar to a good season of television. Even though they're big, long chapters, there's a ton of storylines, he uses cliffhangers geniusly in that project. You can do it in anything. Um, and te the way television works, that they do it very well. So this is Sarah K. Wilson from the Dragon School series. Um, and she found the tighter the writing, the better. None of this is really that new, obviously. You can do this in your novels, too, and probably should in many cases. I think in a novella serial or in any serial, it's even more important um, to have really tight scenes, to have cliffhangers constantly, and always be moving forward, moving forward. Some people ask, did you plot out the entire thing or did you pants it? And again, th there's no right way to do this. For me, I had the rough beats of all nine episodes before I started writing. I knew where they were gonna go. I knew who, about who was gonna get killed. I knew the ultimate villain, but I allowed for some discovery along the way. Um, and that's the way it is for Amelia Rose. She likes to not know what's gonna happen. Um, she likes, this is her style. Um, she wants to be, this would terrify me personally to not have any idea what was happening. A lot of writers I find who write for Vela or Radish, they love not knowing what's happening. They want their readers to be as surprised as they are. So they're just, they have you know, a big setup obviously. They know there's gonna be drama. They know there's gonna be cliffhangers. They don't know where it's going. That would make me a little too nervous that I'd screw it up or paint myself into a corner. But again, anyone who tells you there's a right way to do something like this is lying to you or trying to sell you something. With almost everything you're gonna hear at this conference, I think that's a good thing to remember that we used to have a thing in the, in the 20 books group, hashtag probably, which, which is that there's a lot of great advice there, right? And very little of it applies to everyone in all circumstances. So I hope you all take something from this that is useful to you and come back a year from now and say, hey, here's how I made six figures on my serial project. Uh, that would be the ultimate thing for me and know we've done something useful here. Um, Geneva Lee, who's doing incredibly well uh, with her serial, she plans it out a little bit more. Again, there's an exception to every rule. There's no rules when it comes to this. I like the way she put it here, though. This is about what I did. I knew where I was going. I knew various stops. I had the covers made up in advance. So I knew what cities they were going to go to uh, in each episode. But I didn't know how they were going to get to those cities or exactly what twists were going to happen. If I could do it again, I'd probably plot it more and I could write it a lot faster next time, but there's no right way. I think if you take three words from this and you're trying to write a serial, these are the three words I would take. If you just ignore everything else I say and you're trying to write a serial, make sure you have a setup for drama. That can be true in any genre, I think, whether you're talking about dragons or people or ancient history or space futures. Uh, drama and cliffhangers are going to be the way to go. A lot of readers care about people. Um, and, and again, in, in mine, I've written mysteries that don't have a lot of character development. It's more procedural, and we're just trying to solve a crime. Uh, in this project, to keep people with it, I wanted to make sure I had four or five personal storylines, dead husbands, internal turmoil, things like that, that were going to keep people attached to the characters in a certain way. A kind of opposites attract romance is part of the core. I've never written a romance that, maybe I pulled that off well enough, I don't know, but um, the main thing is the crime, like in most mysteries and thrillers. Geneva Lee sums it up also, cliffhangers. Um, but again, if, you, if you're gonna do this, I would, if you wanna write something as successful as Geneva Lee, go read how she does the cliffhangers. Or if you, you know, read my thing, or read John's thing, read something, figure out how they do them, because I think that is a lot of the art of the success of these things is are the cliffhangers only driving people nuts or are you giving them a lot of juicy satisfaction and then just making them want more? And I think we all kind of can tell the difference between those two things. Marketing. I think we're doing good on time. We have 16 minutes. I'm trying to, I'm gonna try to leave 10 minutes for questions and again, I'll be outside uh, as long as there are people who wanna talk or until noon, whichever comes first. So in 2000, I lived in, in New Orleans for a little bit and I was at a bar one night, probably drinking a beer, and people like this walked in holding free Red Bulls. 
And I had never heard of Red Bull, and I tried not to ever drink Red Bull anymore, but I drank a Red Bull, and I thought, this is the most delicious thing I've ever had. And they said, you should try a Red Bull and vodka. Um, and I thought, that sounds like a really good idea. So I did try a Red Bull and vodka. And uh, I actually, actually, I could have been addicted to Red Bulls. To, to me, it's one of the great flavors. I know most people don't like the flavor. I somehow do. But they just walked in and handed me a $2 can of Red Bull for free. And after that, if I had been a slightly different kind of person, I would have been buying three a day for the rest of my life. And said I didn't do that. But they just gave it to me for free. And that was really my marketing plan with the crime beat. And it's what a lot of people are doing. On Vela, you get some free tokens, and you can start a story. And if the writing is good enough, compelling enough, the whole idea is you'll start buying the tokens because you have to find out what happened. What are the streaming services doing? They're all giving you a month for free. Any sometimes 90 days. You want to try the new show on Apple TV, get your three free 30 days. Netflix, free 30 days, Hulu, all these. They want you to watch the first few episodes of a show, in some cases the first season. The way Disney did it was they put season one of The Mandalorian out after giving everybody who had Verizon a free year of Disney TV. And then season two was gonna drop right after all those free years ended. Everyone is doing this. Um, there's definitely an argument that all the free stuff drives prices down and pollutes the market. I don't exactly agree with that, but particularly for this, it was my strategy. Especially because at the time, I was not a super well-known author. I'm still not like one of the top thriller authors on the planet or anything. So how do I, I write something good enough that people are gonna want the second book and I give away as much as I can for free. So this was my entire marketing strategy. I've gotten better at Facebook ads and AMS ads now. At the time, I really didn't want to commit a lot of time to that, and so I didn't commit a lot of time to that. What I did instead was study every single BookBub email, make sure that my covers were going to hit. I had they featured some of my other stuff, uh, make sure my ARC team was gonna leave some good reviews when it came out, and just hope that they took it. And if they didn't, change the blurb, change the covers until they took it. I knew the writing was good enough and was gonna be there, I knew that already. Um, and we can talk about BookBub. They have people here, but BookBub has really helped make my career, so I'm a big fan of them. Um, and this is what happens. When you get a free BookBub, you get to number one in the entire Kindle store for free books. So again, I'm just giving stuff away here, right? 50,000 copies in a day. Um, and really, in any genre, you can hit top 10, top 20 on the free bookstore. Not, not any genre, I shouldn't say that. Any kind of the major sci-fi, fantasy, romance, the major genres, it's fairly easy to hit top 10, top 20 with a free book bug. So this is when I was in Kindle Unlimited, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, and what happens when you get a free book bug and give away 50,000 copies, then you're, uh, some people ignore it, some people buy the entire series. This is when we had author ranks back in the day. I couldn't find some of my other screenshots, but suddenly all eight other books are you know ranked between two and 30 on the mystery list or the thriller list or whatever list I was on at the time. Um, and that was really my marketing plan. That's not gonna apply to everyone the same way. Sarah, as we'll talk about, she used Facebook ads quite effectively for hers and um, so did John and I'm actually gonna start doing Facebook ads on this series now to try to revamp it because it's, it's died after a few years. So uh, this particular series did incredibly well wide. I think it's actually over half of my sales came wide. They're, they're not wide now. They're all in Kindle Unlimited. I've cycled in and out of Kindle Unlimited with this series. Um, but the BookBub promotions, when this was wide, were by far the most effective strategy. I think in general, uh, and hashtag probably, readers on Apple and Barnes and Noble are a little more likely to want to pay $2.99 for a novella length project than readers on Amazon. I actually did all the metrics and I found that about twice as many people who downloaded episode one for free bought episode two on Apple than on Amazon, which tells me, and there was enough, there was a quarter, I, I've given away a quarter million copies, I think, of episode one now. And so there's a lot of data to back that on. Readers on Apple were more likely to buy episode two um, for $2.99 and read the whole series. I'm not entirely sure where, why that is. It's possible that it's because I don't know why. My voice maybe is a little bit better for Apple people than, than, than Kindle people. I'm not sure. I think they just have a slightly different 
view of the prices too, because also Apple, as we know, doesn't have a Kindle Unlimited. So reviews, our favorite part, and this is part of marketing, because if everyone hated the structure and it was bombarded with one-star reviews, that would have sunk this project game over, turned it into a novel, hope someone will buy it. Um, this is in the, on the first page of, of episode one. It's also in the actual blurb on Amazon, and it was you know, on Apple and Barnes & Noble when it was wide. Feel free to copy this. Uh, some people I know have, actually. I've seen this in multiple novella serials, word for word, copied from my thing, or maybe they came with the same wording. Absolutely fine. I wanted readers to know exactly what they were getting into. Um, I didn't want to hide the fact that this was going to be full of cliffhangers. So I put this on the Amazon page and on page one. This is what you're getting yourself into. Please delete from, I didn't write delete it from your hard drive now if you don't want this, but that's what I was aiming at. So this is the review you saw when you came in. There's quite a few of these. What I love about this one is that she's frustrated, but she's probably going to buy the next one anyway. Um, a lot of people were like that. This person absolutely loved it. This is from Apple. If you guys aren't wide, this is what an Apple review looks like. There's thousands of reviews on Apple now that aren't visible because they're, they're not there anymore. Um, this person's just not in, not in for it, but they loved the first one. You're going to get some of those. Yeah, I, maybe I'll turn that into an ad. That's a, that's a good idea. All right, so the reason I put that, uh, put this, uh, where I did was to try to get as few of these as possible and you are going to get some and um, Go look at your favorite Vela readers and look at the reviews and you're going to see some like this uh, This part this person I think they probably really liked it people get the maddest when they love you and then have a reason to hate you I think this person probably loved it. They might have bought the rest too. I don't know and Then you get a lot of people like this who, are, who get exactly what you're doing and they're in for the whole series that's uh, it's not all negative. And I don't take any of these reviews personally. In this case, I really did read them because I wanted to know, did this structure actually work or was it too aggravating? I gotta get going a little bit here. This one. It, like, it makes it all worthwhile, right? All the lonely mornings when you get a review like this. I had just given away 50,000 copies of this book, right? Uh, for a book bub, and it's like this comes in and just, what do you do? <laughs> Box sets, real quick. Um, they're going to cannibalize the sales of your individual titles. Uh, strategically, I put all the nine titles out, then I started packaging them as box sets. Um, most of the authors I spoke with said you should probably do this even though it's going to cannibalize your sales. John says this is where almost all his revenue came from, was the box sets. This is what mine looked like. It gives you something else to market. If you go look at online, uh, the first book in this series has maybe 2,500 2, reviews, like probably 10,000 across all the sites. And these have maybe a few hundred each, but they consistently sell. And readers will often get the first book for free, and then they'll just go buy all the box sets because it's a little bit cheaper. So it's another thing for them to buy. Uh, don't try to read all this. Find the slide later. John's strategy. He put multiple box sets that were small, and now he has a 21-book box set that he sells for 99 cents. This is hundreds of thousands of words. Uh, but if you read this carefully, you'll see it's doing really well for him. He's already had the individual sales. He markets it. It's in KU, and he gets tons of page reads through this. A lot of consistent income from books that were largely floundering. It's actually a strategy I might try. Don't know about the 99 cents thing. That hurts too much. but. Um, Sarah agrees the box sets cannibalize sales. She wouldn't do it again. She's the only person who disagreed. Um, I don't think there's a right answer here. I would definitely do it again. I would definitely do box sets again. Because novella serials are a slightly different format, she found Facebook ads really effective. When I tried them, they didn't work as well, but I didn't explain what it was well enough. And I also think Facebook ads would have responded better to a different, I used the covers, which I don't think worked well for Facebook ads. I think they worked really well for readers and, and BookBub, but not as well for Facebook ads. So that's something I could revisit. Um, so a little bit about Valor, Radish, and Wattpad. The, the number one things I heard from people were accountability, right? If you're going one chapter a week, it gives you something to focus on. It gives you something to come back to over and over and over again. Motivation, 
the readers are literally waiting for the next chapter and they're waiting for it now, a week at a time, whatever your publishing schedule is. Uh, some found that they could build a big community fairly quickly because like with shows, we talk about stuff in between each episode of our favorite shows. We talk to our friends or listen to podcasts and that Vela and Radish people especially are finding that that works. I don't think that works as well in mystery and thriller. I don't think the communities are as strong there as they are in romance. They're there. They're just, I don't think they're as avid and connected as romance readers are. And then in a couple cases, folks are just re-monetizing old stuff. They're taking old novels that don't sell at all, and they're splicing it up and putting it up on Radish to get a trickle of income from otherwise dead projects, which we have a lot of big earners here, but I also spoke to some people who are just trying to make an extra 50 bucks a month because they're retired and it's just extra income, and that's, I think, equally good. A lot of people, as we know, are finding Vela super difficult, and it's not working very well for a lot of people. It seems like there's some massive earners there and a lot of people who it's not working well for. I actually spoke with someone who works at Vela who um, is an editor there who actually previews a lot of the projects and scores them based on genre and tropes and writing and bumps them up or down in the algorithm based on those things. Um, that I didn't know until he told me that, but it seems to be difficult for the vast majority of people there's questions about whether Amazon is going to keep pushing Vela. They probably will for a while at least, but I don't know for sure. Geneva Lee found huge success. She was already successful. She put it out to her mailing list and almost no one joined uh, Vela to find out about her book at first. This, she's shared, these are her exact screenshots of her stats. Month one, 347 episodes read. Not great. Um, one year later, 102,000 episodes read by publishing something people love consistently over and over and over. So her existing fan base didn't really come with her at first, but she built a new one on Vela by publishing enough fast enough. So I thought that was very <coughs> impressive. And obviously she's doing very well. That's just what she said. By the way, Geneva Lee is going to be um, putting out a book on Vela slash Radish. Follow her on Instagram if you want and you'll hear about that book. She knows more about that type of serial, particularly in romance, paranormal romance, than I do. She, she'll be the one to answer your question. She was super nice to get back to me about this. As I mentioned, fandoms can be built up. This is what Amelia says about it, but more importantly, this is her Patreon stats. She uses her serials to drive people to her Patreon, and then they pay her money every month, consistent income. Um, these are her stats on Patreon for when she hit the right tropes for romance and when she started publishing consistently through Wattpad. Obviously, if you don't think you can publish consistently, serials are not probably the thing for you because you, if I had not delivered on my promises set up in those early books, readers would have been really, really pissed. And so I only did it if I knew I could deliver one of these a month, which was not always easy. And this is uh, someone I spoke with who just wants a little extra money from older books because they're in an elder care situation and is just re-monetizing older stuff on Radish, which I thought was super cool. Okay, I've only left two and a half minutes for questions. I apologize for that. Again, after this is over, I think Craig is back there with a sniper rifle and will take me out if I go too long, but I'll be right outside the doors and we'll answer all questions until noon. Brainstorm your project, whatever. I love talking about this stuff. There's nothing bad. We have time for one or two questions. The mic is right there. Try to just make it brief. Someone ask a brilliant question, I'll answer it in the first minute and a half or so. Yes? I'll ask a quick one just for clarity. So you released the first and then you did one each month? Yes, I released, I released the first three. That's a great question, I should have covered that. The first three came out one week apart. Those were all completely done and polished. So book one, a week later, book two, a week later, book three, and then a month later, book four, a month later, book five, a month later, book six. That's how I did it. Um, I wish I could have done them maybe every two weeks instead, but I didn't get it together to do that. Any other questions in the minute and a half we have? Yes, sir. So after you completed your uh, series, did you immediately go into another series or, or what, what did you do next? Yeah, so after completing it, did I go to another series? No. Friends asked me what I was working on after this series really took off in 2020, and I said I was working on career suicide, which was I took up uh, a bunch of other projects 
a more of a literary crime novel, a side passion project, which isn't out yet. If I was all about the money, I would have written The Crime Beat Season 2, and by now The Crime Beat Seasons 3 and 4 would be out, and who knows uh, what would have happened. I know they would have been hugely successful. Um, but Season 1 did well enough, and I didn't feel passionate enough about doing the next one as I did about the other stuff, and for me, it wasn't about maximizing all potential revenue. I just wanted to write other stuff and kind of had a side quest into traditional publishing um, based on the success of this. So stuff happened. I probably will never write season two. Um, I might write in this format again, though. Yes, we have 20 seconds. Uh, do you think using pre-made variations is important for serials where you need to buy, like, nine covers? Do I think pre-made variations are important for serials? Covers that look similar, I think, are super important because I wanted it to look like one thing, and I wanted it to look beautiful, which to me those covers do, that probably don't hit everyone. So yeah, if your covers don't, they need to look consistent, I would say, but I don't think they need to be variations on a pre-made. You could hire a designer and have them do nine you know, spaceships, but fonts, all that you need to have really consistent, because you want them to look just like any series, you want the branding to be spot on. And thank you all for coming, I will be right outside. Have a great uh, week. A great couple days. Thank you so much.